we are now ready to move on to our next phase. So this morning we've talked about negotiation, we've talked about conflict, collaboration. You all know what we've talked about and thought about. Part of the reason for getting together like this is also to celebrate the fact that there are women amongst us who have just taken down barriers and who have really excelled at what they do. And so in your uh, pamphlet or your packet is uh, Lisa Thomas Laurie's bio. So I'm not going to read it to you because what we're really looking to hear about and to understand is how she has achieved all she has achieved. And when we talk about earlier this morning, when we talked about those negative thoughts that we might have and need to control or need to stop, there are people sitting in this room and people uh, like Lisa Thomas Laurie who have accomplished a great deal. And I welcome Lisa Thomas Laurie and for her to come to the stage. Thank you. And be careful. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here, and I want to start off by thanking you for your patience today. Murphy's Law was in effect a little bit at my home before I left today, but it's all good. <laughs> I, um, I started talking with Jody a few months ago, and she told me what um, your Women's Leadership Forum hoped to achieve and what it was about, and I thought it, I thought it was really important that I be here today. Um, because of what I have been through, but what I have overcome. And it has been quite a journey, but all of us have a journey. And I think when something happens that is totally unexpected in your life, you find that you're much more resilient than you thought you would be. I was, um, I was at the height of my career when I had my unexpected event. And I am so sorry, but I've got to get a few little things in order here. <clears throat> I was at the height of my career. I was in very, very good health. I was starting to exercise and at the time, my sons used to tease me. They said, Mom, your arms look like Madonna's. <laughs> if it had been later, I hoped they would say that they looked like Michelle's. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, life was good. My boys were doing well. My oldest son, Langston, was about to go to college. The first in our family to be accepted at an Ivy League school, Brown University up in Providence, and my younger son was doing well in high school, and Bill and I, my husband, were looking forward to becoming empty nesters. I was just on top of the world, and I was on the fringes, I felt, even after 20-some years in the business, on the fringes of learning what it was like to become a real leader among women in my industry. And then I noticed a strange numbness, a tingling, pins and needles, they call it sometimes, in my toes and feet. What did I do? I did probably what most busy professional women with families do. I ignored it for a little while. I am reminded by my colleagues that I was holding on to the walls as I went about my work at Channel 6, and even grabbing a shoulder or two along the way. I have this little raspy thing, so I'm going to take sips now and then. I would grab a shoulder as I was 
trying to meet a television deadline and go about my business. I remember thinking for the longest time that I probably had just developed some bad calluses on the bottoms of my feet. So I went and I had a spa pedicure to see if that would resolve the problem. When the pedicure produced no results, I saw a podiatrist. He gave me cortisone shots, steroid shots, between my toes. That helped with the pain, but after several series of shots, the numbness and the tingling worsened. What I would realize later as I did my regular workout was that my ankles were weakening as I did my power walks across the neighborhood and around my community. I noticed that when I would come to the inclines, it would take longer and be more difficult to walk up them. I could barely make it coming back by the time our half hour power walk was over and it had been the easiest endeavor just a few weeks earlier. My husband, a doctor, arranged for me to see a neurologist who after administering several tests, including an EMG, a nerve conduction study, determined that I had some nerve damage. My uh, ankles proved to be about 30% weaker than they had, or they should. I went from one doctor to another, and finally to a friend of my husband's, his mentor in medical school. He told me he thought I had a rare illness called Poems Syndrome. My husband had never heard of it, and other family friends and doctors, acquaintances, had never heard of it. It was like the poem with the rhyming verses, but this one was an acronym, and each letter stood for uh, a feature, a symptom of the disease. P for polyneuropathy, O for organomegaly, which was enlarged organs, E for endocrinopathy, changes in the endocrine system, M for mono monoclonal gammopathy, that was the underlying blood issue that all patients have who are suffering from poems, irregular blood protein and S for skin changes. I had noticed that my skin was becoming sort of a grayish, bluish color, very dull and, and strange. I had four of the five symptoms and would soon have them all. But this particular doctor told me he had, he had seen only five patients in his career. In addition, he was leaving my community hospital and he was going down to Atlanta to Morehouse uh, to do medical research. I couldn't be his patient. So he referred me to a neurologist at Johns Hopkins and another hematologist at our hospital for more testing. The two of them put their heads together and decided they didn't think I had poems. They thought I had an autoimmune disease, CIDP, and they began treating me for that. CIDP is not to be mistaken with COPD. CIDP is a chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And of course, remember I had that polyneuropathy that started in my toes and my feet, worked, ex worked its way up to my ankles, and by now was, had reached my calves. They suggested that I take prednisone, and they put me on a series of blood cleansing treatments called plasmapheresis. I, I underwent that treatment for 18 months. My condition slowly worsened. We asked them to revisit poems. They said they would, but just to give this some time. Of course, it was difficult to determine how I was feeling sometimes because the steroids mask your symptoms. It gave me spurts of energy and I would occasionally think I was doing better. That was until my vocal cord became paralyzed. And as you can see, it's no longer paralyzed, but I still have some, some issues with it. Then I became unable to digest food properly. The nerves were being damaged internally. The vagus nerve in my stomach wasn't working properly. 
I think it's important to mention that by this time, I had to make the very difficult decision to leave work and focus entirely on my health. And as it became necessary to file for disability, I discovered that first I had to file for Social Security. And I filled out a two-inch stack of forms. And I began to wonder how on earth is that or would that viewer in Kensington or West Philadelphia or North Philadelphia who didn't have the, the resources, perhaps they didn't have the education I had, they didn't have a doctor perhaps as a husband, how would they navigate this? How would they handle this? It was so overwhelming to me. Plus, you're, you're feeling horrible. It was extremely frustrating. I became depressed. And I just wasn't sure what was going to come next. I remember making a promise to God at that time that if I made it through this illness, I would find a way to try to help people understand, to tackle and defeat those same obstacles that were confronting me then. I went to Florida for an unconventional treatment. My husband, being a Western-taught doctor, didn't know if it was a great idea, but he thought the sunshine and the warm weather we had, we had, um, it came on the, the heels of a really rough winter in Philadelphia, and he thought at least the sunshine, the nice weather, a change of scenery would do me good. So my mother accompanied me just about everywhere I went back then. Someone at home had to hold down the fort and be there for my younger son, Leland, and um, earn a living. It was then that I became grateful for hospital volunteers when I was in Florida. Dazed, I remember the second time I was hospitalized. I became violently ill. And that second time, I was going to stay a while. I had spent more than five hours in the emergency room. When I was finally admitted, I was nauseous, and it continued. Doctors couldn't figure out what to do. Days passed. One afternoon, a hospital volunteer, a male nurse, stopped by my room as I was going through an especially bad spell and just began rubbing my back. He saw that my hair was a little fuzzy and frizzy. Do you like French braids? I'll French braid your hair. Just a small little gesture made me feel so good, so good. He talked to me in the most calming and soothing voice. He was a godsend at that moment, and later he was the one who discovered that a painkiller I had been described, Dilaudid, was actually worsening my condition, was causing excessive nausea. He talked to the doctor. They took me off of that, replaced it with something else. And finally, I was feeling much, much better. I, on, the, on the advice of that volunteer, I stayed in the hospital a few more days. The doctor agreed. And when I returned home, of course, my underlying illness was still a mystery. It was around that time that I learned a valuable lesson about people and the human spirit. My housekeeper of nine years and I formed an unlikely friendship around that same time. Before she was my employee, I was her employer, but it had turned into much more than that. She helped me, she was compassionate, she would um, do those extra little things. I'm sure she was extremely happy that I had lost all desire for things to, for deadlines and things to be in order. And <laughs> she extended herself as well to make sure that I was comfortable. I learned that you really should look within every person you meet. I was told by my doctors that I was improving, that it was just a slow process, but I knew in my heart it wasn't true. As a doctor in another specialty, my husband was terribly frustrated, and I was becoming, beginning to become anyway, rebellious. I was fed up with depending on others, telling me how I was feeling, that I was improving, I knew I wasn't, how I was looking, how I was walking, oh, your gait's so wonderful. I didn't see those improvements, at least not significantly. 
After one more very bad stomach illness, and my unyielding insistence that I was not getting better, I was referred by my gastroenterologist, of all people, to go to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He told me that there was a wonderful little Italian woman, a doctor, an oncologist, who had written the standard of care for poem syndrome. And perhaps we should revisit it. She subjected me to another week of poking and prodding and testing. And then without hesitation on the last day of that week, she told me that I had poem syndrome. I sure did. And I had had it all along. And it was shutting me down that that first mentor had been right. I'm too weak right now, she said, to get a bone marrow transplant, but I guarantee you when you're strong enough, you'll be much, much better, perhaps not 100%, but up in the 80s and the 90s. And she sent me home and gave me some, a new diet, new, special nutrition to build me up, a little more chemo to wipe out the bad blood cells. Told me to come back in a couple of months, which I did. And I had the bone, the stem cell transplant. In 2004, have made significant, significant process, uh, progress ever since, but I did have to have another transplant in 2015 when poems didn't wipe me out like the first time, but reared its ugly head again, and we had to nip it in the bud before it became progressive. So what have I learned from my experiences? That you should live your life to the fullest each day, that you really shouldn't sweat the small stuff. That was hard for a type personality like myself. That we should listen to our bodies, take care of our bodies, giving ourselves the proper rest, the proper food. That if something doesn't feel right, get it checked out now. Don't delay. That if we don't feel comfortable with a particular doctor or a medical staff member, don't stay with them. Leave. If you don't like his tone, her tone, you don't like their bedside manner, go to someone else. If he or she doesn't show you respect, tell them so. Leave. Don't go back. I've also learned that we have to look at the people around us, those we see every day, and put ourselves in their shoes. Try to understand them, show them some compassion when you're going through your busy life. Everything you've got to do is so important. Take a closer look at some of the people you come upon every day. As far as our journey towards success, I'm still working at it. We so often define success in material terms. I remember when I first came from Institute West Virginia I had a job in Oklahoma, then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and each time my salary got a little bigger. By the time I got to Philadelphia, five years in, I was making more money than I ever imagined I would make. But now I'm learning to be successful in my soul. I'm learning to like myself. I'm learning to love myself. I'm learning to forgive myself, because if you really think about it, an apology isn't worth very much if you can't forgive yourself first. And we must have that inward love. We, it has to be internalized. You can't give love if you don't have love to give, and you only have love to give when you love yourselves. Each of us has a right to a happiness that transcends all the materialistic things that surround us. And each of us has a right to a joy that we nurture and sustain in the wellspring of our being. So I thank you for having me today. I wish all of you joy, good health, happiness, love, self-love. And I hope in some small way that what I've shared today will impact you positively as you carry on in your lives. 
And thank you very much. So for all of you, a gift of a book, I'd like to acknowledge Kirkfield and Marsha Field and Cindy DeCiani as the supporters of us being able to give you those books today. The book is On Camera and Off, When the News is Good and When It's Not, and it is by Lisa. And uh, she will stay around uh, as well. She's going to join us for lunch, and she will stay around to sign, uh, to autograph the books as well. Yeah. When we uh, reached out to Lisa several months ago, she made note, uh, she immediately accepted our invitation in what I have grown to understand is her characteristic uh, graciousness. It's been a great pleasure to connect with her and have an opportunity today for which we are enormously grateful to have a sense of her hurdles and her triumphs to date in a remarkable life and to have lived it with such gusto and to have shared it with such authenticity and um, uh, something that's touched me very deeply just um, with a truth telling that uh, sometimes comes very hard to all of us. Um, it, was a very, it was a very moving um, opportunity to learn from that. When we conversely uh, reached out to Beverly, Kendra, and Sarah, and uh, Suzanne last spring, after frankly, what I considered to me an exalting, uh, exhaustive search um, looking for the right trio, um, they were all extraordinarily keen to jump on board. And not only did each of them work um, fairly tirelessly at chunks to provide something they thought would be really meaningful to you, but like their predecessors last year, came together from afar and uh, local to make sure that it was synergistic, that it worked together well, and that with any luck, uh, there's an opportunity to take away some things today that will be helpful to you personally and might really project into your professional and other kinds of lives. We um, are hoping very much that today's initiative will have um, an effect on our focus at the foundation on enhancing contributions of women in Montgomery County, and we're endlessly uh, grateful to each of these women. I have a few um, final remarks, if I may. The first is uh, Virginia started the day off with um, uh, a, a jumpstart um, beg for um, a way in which we could um, move forward the foundation's prepubescent um, social media. So we were at. <laughs> 19 this morning, so anything beyond that will make going back to the office today really, really pleasant for my colleagues and myself. So thank you for anything. Um, we've sort of um, hit the road here, and we're appreciative for um, your support in that. The second is that uh, traditionally after one of these get-togethers, we do a pretty thorough evaluation, and then we offer as part of the package some ongoing workshops in the new year. So we'll be reaching out to you again very shortly with some follow-up materials from today, but then probably um, a little later in the month, early year, with some opportunities to come together for a workshop. Last year we had standing room only and had to move it to a larger place. So we'll, we'll look at what you're most keen to drill down further on, We'll find the right speakers and we'll bring you all together as you would choose and uh, continue the conversation in ways that are in sort of smaller groups and perhaps a little more targeted and intense. And the final piece is that we traditionally do um, a quick photograph before lunch and there's quite a grand staircase when you walk out to the left. If you would be kind enough just to waltz over there for a moment, um, our photographer who's used to this gang uh, will take care of that quickly. At which point you have a couple of moments just to kind of rest, check um, whatever you wish to, and we'll be moving down the hallway to the right. Uh, the far door will open onto the dining room where we'll have an opportunity to have one final um, check today at the content of women in leadership. We are um, immensely grateful that you would have chosen to invest today um, in any number of ways, including uh, that most precious of things, your time to be together with um, such uh, extraordinary women in all the ways in which leadership uh, represents itself, from the traditional sense to those of us who are just wanting to gain um, a new way of looking at our own lives, the, the whole gradation. Um, we hope that uh, it's been worthwhile to you in some way, 
and um, we want you to know that it means uh, an enormous amount to us that you would choose to be with us. So many thanks for being um, such um, extraordinarily um, good colleagues and such good company this morning, and we hope that after a small break and a quick photograph, you'll have a chance to enjoy a really lovely lunch and some more substance to send you on your way around 2.30ish after you get your book and your book signing. Lisa, all the women involved, bottom of our hearts, thank you so, so very much. Thank you.